Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for checking in on this recorded lecture on positionality. Um, I'm going to spend the next few moments talking about um, positionality. Uh, it's an important concept um, that we talk about as researchers, especially in action research, and it has a lot of relevance um, to your work doing the capstone this year. So um, it's important to fully understand and name your positionality as you begin collaborating with an organization or a department on campus for a project that's related to leadership or changing an organization. Um, so while a lot of the reading this week uh, may have pertained to researchers, um, I really invite you as we, as I start talking about these concepts to think about how these concepts apply to you as a leader um, who is gonna be collaborating with others for your capstone project. Um, researchers have long thought about their own power and status with regard to potential participants in a, in a research study. Um, historically, as you may have heard, probably a lot of unethical stories about research in the past, um, researchers have held a lot of privileged identities, um, and their work has often been exploitative of their study participants. So uh, just imagine being you know, an academic with status and power in the ivory tower. Um, your job is to study communities. Um, you're studying a local community, like a local community that is marginalized. And then you leave the community after you collect your data, you publish the results, you publish the research in the form of an academic manuscript for a journal, and that counts towards um, your tenure portfolio, or it, it contributes to your career in some way. Um, and, and we have to question that because often these products, these academic products, these articles often benefit the researcher's career only. And most of the time, they do not actually help make things more equitable for the community that they're studying with or that they've collaborated with. Um, often they, they sweep into a community and then leave um, once the data collection is over. And so we have to think about the ethics of that. Um, relating that back to your capstone project, um, ideally, we don't want that to happen. We want the collaboration to you know, be sustainable. We wanted to have some sort of equitable um, impact on the uh, department or um, organization or community that you'll be working with. So in the following slides, we're going to learn um, about how to visualize or to conceive of the different types of collaborations that take place among researchers when they enter communities. And uh, think also about your own relationships with your departments and organizations. So in this table, um, this is taken from this week's readings on Heron Anderson and action research. Um, we learned one form of research approach, it's action research. And um, action research attempts to make research for social change by doing research with um, the participants that they're studying. Um, ethical researchers are well aware of the extent to which they're in collaboration with the community that they're working with. And so looking at this table, um, the spectrum um, runs from being a total, in, a total insider doing a self-study of your own organization or department to the outsider doing studies on insiders exclusively uh, with little involvement from the insiders themselves. Um, in your capstone project, you know, um, take this research example and think about your own positionality um, with a potential collaborator. Many capstone students, um, but not all, um, seek a reciprocal collaboration. So that's in the, uh, the fifth row of this table. Um, a reciprocal collaboration is, is present when there is a trusting, collaborative relationship. Um, but, you know, we understand that this is, the world is very complicated. You know, there are often constraints, like a lack of time on part of the insider, um, a lack of resources, and capstone students often find themselves in the model of being an outsider to um, an organization or a department being collaboration with them, where you have to reach out and consult. So the, the, uh, the row after reciprocal collaboration, so outsider and collaboration with, with insiders. Our goal here is not perfection of a perfect reciprocal collaboration, but think of it as, you know, we're striving for that trusting collaborative relationship 
but we have to be realistic about what's possible under, you know, um, constrained time and uh, resources. <clears throat> so again, when thinking about your potential collaboration with a department or an organization, it's important to know what you and your collaborator bring to the project. Um, Hare and Anderson, the authors for our assigned reading on action research, um, advocated for quadrant one as the ideal. Um, when we enter a project with the idea that we know and they know, our goal is to share our knowledge, resources, and ideas equally and democratically. Um, we each set the agenda and engage in the process together. However, again, I want to repeat this. We know that we often don't reach this ideal. It's very, very difficult, very rare. Um, often when organizations are under-resourced, you know, when departments are burdened with so many multiple priorities, especially in this particular context in our world, uh, the, pro the process often transforms into quadrant three. We know, they don't know. Uh, while this is not ideal, we have to realize that there are constraints to what form of collaboration that we really desire. Um, quadrant one requires resources, commitment, and other conditions to be fully realized. Now that we know about various positionalities of being insiders, outsiders, um, let's say that you're collaborating with a potential partner, okay? It's important to reflect um, from time to time during the project, you know, this year, how is this collaboration playing out? Um, does it feel like a form of co-option in the first row over there? Um, this is where your collaborators are often treated as tokens, but have no real input or power. You're making all the decisions. Um, oftentimes we see in organizations where um, leaders are claiming that they value the input um, and feedback of everyone else in the organization. However, we know that it's, it's purely symbolic. Um, people are being tokenized. And really, um, all the uh, major decisions are being called out by a small group of powerful people within the organization. And so it's real co-option. So sometimes on the face of it, it looks like cooperation or co-learning. But when you really look at the dynamics at play, it's really co-option. Um, is the collaboration cooperative at, at a certain point? Are you working together closely, but you know they're, they're really busy, there's limited time, limited resources, so at, at the end of the day, the responsibility is for you to direct the process, or um, is it co-learning? Um, is there a period in the process where uh, it's democratic, equitable? Um, are you, you know, sharing knowledge together, creating uh, a new project together? an actual collaboration where you're working with them or by them. Um, now, we know that this fluctuates. Relationships, you know, go through different stages. There are different constraints at different times. Sometimes it feels like co-option. Sometimes it feels like consultation. Some aspects may feel like co-learning. Um, maybe collective action if it gets to that point. Um, and then also in the previous slides, you may have noticed, like, you know, being an insider or outsider, um, Sometimes you're both. Sometimes you have an inside, you know, perspective of the organization or department, or you have a position within the department. But as an outsider, you're also, you know, think about your different roles as students. So that may place you on the outside piece of the relationship. Um, so, you know, moving forward as when you're thinking about your collaboration um, with a department or organization, um, it's important that you uh, name and really be clear about what your positionality is um, so that you can be critical um, about how you're working with them, um, be reflective about how you're working with them. And if you feel that you know, you're in a position of co-option, you can actually name it because you've learned about this. And you, know, you could make the steps to move towards a more cooperative or co-learning type of participation with them. So as you're moving towards the year, you know, um, I don't want you to stress out about a positionality. We have to recognize, you know, um, that there are constraints to the process. Um, but again, overall, um, the ability and the capacity to name what's happening can be very, very powerful. 